Hey, this is the 80 Slasher Librarian, just letting you guys know if you enjoy the content here on the channel and want to support the channel, click on the Patreon link in the description below. As I'm not allowed to monetize the channel here on YouTube, I depend on you guys to keep this channel going and growing by becoming patrons of the channel and sponsoring at the Patreon page. There's great rewards for doing so in tiers as low as 2 to $5 per month. Hey everybody, it's CJ Graham, Jason, Friday the 13th Part 6. Hell Cop and Highway to Hell. Hey, I just want to make sure you guys know you're listening to the 80s slasher librarian. Hi, this is Kane Hodder. Better known as Jason from Friday the 13th, Victor Crowley from Hatchet. I've also played BTK, Ed Gein. Let's just say I've murdered a lot of people. In fact, I've murdered more people on film than any actor in history. So just keep that in mind. You are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. Keep listening, or I'll kill you. Just cause you're playing cool Don't think you got this fool tonight Friday the 13th, Part 4, The Final Chapter, a fan novelization by Landon Turner. Chapter 1, Murders in the Morgue. What the hell is going on? thought 48-year-old Tracy Jarvis as she quietly crept down the staircase into the living room. She glanced behind her, making sure that the ruckus hadn't stirred her two kids sound asleep in their beds. The whirring of helicopter blades had jolted her awake, and glancing out her bedroom window, she had seen red and blue flashing lights flying down the country road past her cabin on Crystal Lake. Something big had to be going on. Nothing like this typically happened in Crystal Lake. The only other time that something like this had happened that Mrs. Jarvis could remember was five years ago when that Voorhees woman hacked up all those kids at the campgrounds. She remembered that like it was yesterday. It had been all over the news. The town of Crystal Lake, which had always been a quiet and safe community, was crawling with reporters for months and months afterwards. Every time she drove into town to go to the grocery store, there were people huddled in groups or of twos or threes at the checkout line, whispering excitedly about the murders, all talking about Camp Blood and how it was all the fault of the family who reopened the death trap in the first place. When she had lived in the city, she had never seen anything like that. Everyone that lived in the city mostly kept to their own. Mrs. Jarvis almost liked it better that way. Not that she didn't admire the way that everyone in Crystal Lake seemed to know each other and the quaint and quirky atmosphere. It was just the fact that she felt a little left out. When she first got here, she never got a warm welcome and the locals seemed to be able to detect the urban aura that she had around her because all she got were dirty looks and groups of people whispering about her. At least in the city, it wasn't just her that was left out. Everyone kept to their own, never singling out any other person. Everyone minded their own business. She wondered why she even decided to move out to the country. Then she remembered why. There was a shooting right down the street from the Jarvis apartment, and with that, Mrs. Jarvis took her two kids and left. There was no way she was keeping her kids around that sort of thing. They could grow up traumatized, start getting bad grades in school, get into drugs and other awful things that the kids got into nowadays. The proverbial straw that broke the camel's back was when she found out her husband was in love with someone else, with his young, sexy co-worker. They had been married for almost 20 years. They had two kids together. How could he just throw it away like that? 20 years of marriage. Trisha's first steps, Tommy's first words, all of it evidently meant nothing. What really bothered her was that she hadn't noticed the signs, the distant look in his eye, the weak smiling, the forced conversations. Her woman's intuition had failed her. Or maybe she just wasn't listening. She felt like it was something she had done, but then again, feelings sometimes just go away. And you can't control how you feel towards someone. 
How could she blame him? They were both getting middle-aged and were going through their own personal crises, while at the same time raising two teenagers. Falling out of love happens. People leave. People can start to feel differently about things. Yes, she was hurt, but she knew what she had to do. The only thing she could do was leave. Besides, the marriage wasn't doing so well before he set her down at the kitchen table and slapped the divorce papers down in front of her. They all knew it. Trish and Tommy both knew it. They all knew that they were just staying together for the sake of the kids. It was all they could do. She worried about her children enough as it was, with growing up in the city and being exposed to God knows what, but it would be even harder on them without a father. So she stayed with him as long as she could. But eventually, things just get too hard to manage, and so you have to leave. But why did she have to pick a hick town like Crystal Lake? And now, all these murders? She left the city to get away from that sort of thing, and only a few months after they moved in, the Voorhees woman went insane and killed a bunch of kids at a campground just a few miles up the dirt road from where they were nestled on the shore of the lake. And now this? God, what was next? She shot another nervous glance out the big picture window blew a strand of wispy blonde hair out of her face, and then crossed the living room to the television set and turned it on. A male newscaster was seated at his desk, staring solemnly into the camera, reading off of a teleprompter. The Crystal Lake Massacre is indeed not entirely over, as authorities have recently found more mutilated bodies left behind by the masked maniac who has left a trail of corpses all over the 20-acre campground and the surrounding area. A lone survivor, a young girl whose name has not yet been released, managed to put a stop to the murderer's crime spree, and the man who has terrorized the small community for the last two days is now believed to be dead. My God, Mrs. Jarvis thought to herself. An image of a large two-story log cabin in the middle of an isolated clearing was superimposed onto the screen, where gurneys piled high with blood-soaked corpses were being wheeled down the front steps. Police cars and ambulances were scattered across the front yard of the house. The camera panned over to a large red barn where another body was being wheeled out into the back of an ambulance. A police helicopter hovered over the scene, shining a giant spotlight around the perimeter of the property, searching for more bodies. Jesus, she muttered to herself. More murders and another young girl left traumatized. She couldn't imagine what the poor thing had been through. To see all of her friends getting killed and then to watch helplessly as her life turns into a nightmare before her eyes. My God, who was it this time? Who did this to her? Pamela Voorhees? But the Voorhees woman was dead, wasn't she? She had to be. Mrs. Jarvis had heard something about her head being lopped off. She grimaced, thinking about it. No, this was someone else. The newscaster had described a man. Another maniac, just like the Voorhees woman. Jesus! There has to be something in the water here, she thought. She felt a chill run up her arm and she moved to the front door to make sure it was locked. She didn't exactly know why she was insisting on the door being locked. The newscaster said that the guy was dead, after all. But something was bothering her. A pang of dread hit her in the gut, and she instinctively checked anyway. She turned her attention back to the television, where paramedics were loading another body into the back of an ambulance. The newscaster appeared on screen again. Sources have informed us that the man responsible for the killings is being taken to the Wessex County Medical Center, where further examination is to be made. Wessex County was only the neighboring county. It wasn't very far from the lake. Mrs. Jarvis stared grimly out into the night. She couldn't help but feel paranoid with all the murders happening. She felt another shiver up her spine as she tried to block the ghastly images from her mind. Crystal Lake was going to become the murder capital of the United States pretty soon, Mrs. Jarvis thought, sitting on the sofa. She jerked her head towards the door. Was that a noise? Was it? No, no, it had to be the wind or something. Mrs. Jarvis silently scolded herself. She was just scaring herself silly. After all, it was foolish to sit at home and be afraid of a dead man. It was foolish, right? He was dead. The maniac was dead. It was a dark and wet night, still soaked from the drizzling rain and the thunderstorm that had been brewing on and off for the last two hours. Storm clouds rolled across the night sky, not managing to obscure the silvery outline of the full moon. It had been a rainy summer, even for the northeast. 
The trees swayed gently in the night breeze. It was all peaceful and quiet, save for the circling police helicopters, bright searchlights, and about a dozen police cars and ambulances scattered around an isolated farmhouse and redwood barn nestled in a clearing by the lake. The two bright headlight beams and flashing sirens cut through the darkness, illuminating a wooden sign that read Higgins Haven in scrawled letters, Wessex County Medical Center was emblazoned on the side of the medical transport vehicle that was driving tediously down the uneven, partially flooded dirt road. The trees cleared, and near a small stand of trees, the two-story farmhouse stood on the shore of the lake, the red and white lights shimmering on the glassy, smooth surface. The headlights of the ambulance hit the police officer directing traffic in the face, and he waved his arms in the air, signaling for the caravan to stop. The passenger, a tired-looking male paramedic in his forties, rolled down his window. The traffic cop approached, slossing through a mud puddle and squinting through the sprinkling rain. "'What do you need and where do you need it?' the male medic asked. The cop pointed towards the open barn doors. "'We got a body over there in the barn. It's been a busy night. We got ten bodies. You got the last one,' the cop said. It was clear in the tone of his voice that he had seen more than enough carnage for the night." and was thankful to have been given the mundane task of directing traffic. Stress was written all over his face. "'What's wrong with him?' the medic asked. "'He's dead,' the cop said grimly. "'Yeah, they're all dead.' He looked like he had seen a ghost. The paramedic turned to the driver of the ambulance, a young, slim black woman in her late twenties. "'Some emergency, they're all dead,' he said. She made a wry face and drove through the wooden gate into the property." veering the ambulance sharply towards the front of the barn and parking. The two medics stepped out onto the muddy ground and ran through the rain towards the back doors of the ambulance. They both heaved the heavy doors open and lifted a gurney out of the back compartment and began rolling it inside the barn. The young black medic scrunched up her nose in disgust as the smell of fresh hay and manure mingled with the stench of death. She stopped short and stared down in disbelief at the enormous man sprawled across the barn floor an axe protruding from his skull. A hockey mask was pulled over his face. The blade of the axe had broken through the thin plastic and embedded itself in his forehead. The tall, portly mustache police chief, his uniform obscured by the thick sheen of a rain poncho, was hovering over the body. Next to him, a forensic technician was snapping photos with his camera, and another technician was dusting for fingerprints. "'Is this the guy who's been leaving the wet stuff?' the male medic asked. Yep, he got seven kids and three bikers, but this time they got him, the police chief said, staring down grimly at the axe firmly lodged in the masked man's cranium. The female medic watched as the body of a young biker chick clad in leather was being rolled out of the barn on a gurney, her dead eyes gazing up at the ceiling, five bloody puncture wounds forming a second mouth across her throat. The medic shivered down to her soul. She had never seen anything like this in her entire life. My God, she thought, this was him? She stared down at the body of the masked man in a mix of horrified fascination and bewilderment. His skin was deformed and graying, his nails black and broken, his hands covered in blood. The olive green tattered work suit and slacks he was wearing were also caked with dried blood. He really killed them all? She thought to herself. Those poor kids. The thought of what they had experienced in their last hours was getting to her. The man didn't even look human. She silently prayed to herself that she wouldn't have to see what was underneath that mask. She couldn't believe people actually went out and put on masks and just started killing innocent people. But it was right before her eyes. She had already seen what he had done at the counselor training center on the opposite side of the lake. A kid in a wheelchair with a machete driven through his skull. Two kids impelled on a spear. The sick shit you see in those cheap slasher flicks. He must have been absolutely insane. She couldn't even begin to process it. She was completely tuning out the inane dialogue between the police chief and the ambulance driver. She couldn't tear her eyes away from him. All right, let's belt him, said the male medic, snapping his female companion out of her trance. One of the crime scene investigators reached down with gloved hands and yanked the axe free from the man's skull with a sickening pop. The female medic struggled to stifle her own grimacing. She was already being leered at, by all those homicide detectives, and she didn't want them chortling to themselves about her being a rookie. The investigator slid the blood-stained axe down into an 
clear evidence baggie and sealed it. It took four men to heave Jason Voorhees' lifeless body onto the stretcher. The female medic then placed the sheet over him hurriedly, as if she were ripping off a band-aid, and stepped away as the male medic strapped him in. The woman took one side of the metal stretcher and started to walk with her partner out of the barn. As they began to roll him out of the barn, Jason's grimy, blood-caked hand slipped out from underneath the sheets, and his fingertips brushed the female medic's thigh. She leapt out of her skin, letting out a startled yelp. Several of the men laughed. "'What's the matter with you?' the male medic asked, grinning from ear to ear. "'He's dead!' Christ, this place is a pile of shit, said 38-year-old Axel Burns, watching a light fixture flicker and buzz out. It was no secret that the Wessex County Medical Center morgue wasn't the best-kept facility. The hallways were narrow and dimly lit. The wallpaper was peeling. Most of the bulbs in the overhead ceiling lights had blown years ago. There had been some seedy going-ons with upper-level management at the hospital, and Axel got to hear the juicy bits from one of his security guard buddies. It turned out that one of the corporate representatives was dealing coke, and then some more shit happened, and long story short, nobody gave a fuck about the morgue. It was all he could do to alleviate his boredom, but gossip about just what juicy happenings were going on at this place of employment. They were always understaffed. Axel had to work nights and clean up the leftovers from the day shift. Bodies were constantly getting switched, lost, and there were constant complaints against Axel for what they said was unprofessionalism. He didn't know that you had to be professional to work in a dump like this. He was a morgue attendant, not a doctor. He wasn't even the one that helped with autopsies. He just made sure bodies came in and out and got where they needed to go. He ran his thumb along the wall and grimaced as he stared at the filth that came off onto his rubber glove. I've worked in this shithole for way too long, he thought to himself. Being a morgue attendant sounded sort of exciting when he had read about it in the classifieds about five years ago. Sounded easy, too. He tried taking a job working with people, but he quickly discovered he didn't have the patience. So why not take a job where the only people you'd really have to work with are dead as a doornail? And it was a fairly easy job, even if he did work the night shift. The first few weeks it had been a piece of cake. But five long years of taking corpses into the cold room, sticking them in the freezer like a slab of meat, signing paperwork after paperwork, and doing coffee runs wasn't what Axel had imagined. He bit into his tomato and mayo sandwich, licked his fingers, and reached over to turn on the tiny television set that he had set up to stimulate himself for the mind-numbing lull of the night shift. He sat down on the edge of a folded gurney and took another bite. He hit the channel button on the remote, and a group of women in tight black leotards doing aerobics flashed onto the screen. Some sort of late-night raunchy workout tape. Alex grinned. The girl in the middle had a huge rack, and Axel felt himself getting a stiffy. "'Hi, girls,' he said to himself, staring lewdly at the screen. "'Could you blame a guy? Nothing to do around this dump but get your rocks off,' he thought. Just as he caught a glimpse down the front of the blonde chick's leotard, he heard the doors leading to the morgue bang open. He groaned in annoyance. "'Great, another body. Another one of those kids that got killed up at Crystal Lake,' he thought." Axel walked out into the dimly lit hallway. The body was coming towards him, a huge mass on a gurney covered with a white sheet that was being pushed by a tough-looking medic and a young black woman, her naturally frizzy hair wet from the rain with a grim expression. Axel waited as they rolled the stretcher towards him and handed him a clipboard. Axel laid his sandwich down on the body and took the clipboard, hastily and illegibly scribbling his signature at the bottom of the page. The male medic gave him a frown. "'This is your last?' the medic asked. "'Nah, I got one more in there,' Axel said, pointing to the cold room. "'She's a real cute girl.' "'Was,' the medic corrected him. Axel shrugged and glanced back at the cold room. "'Eh, she still is.' The medic's jaw tightened. The young black woman's tightly pursed lips screwed into a disapproving grimace. "'All you gotta do is go over there and, uh... Axel made an obscene gesture, a grin spreading across his face. The female medic let out a cry of disgust and yanked the clipboard out of Axel's hand. Nice talk, real nice talk, the male medic said, mortified. I get the top copy. 
Axel held his hands up in the air defensively, ripped off the first page of the clipboard, and handed it to the medic, and they both made their way back down the hallway, shaking their heads. What? Axel thought. Does nobody have a sense of humor anymore? He pulled back the sheets on the stretcher, and he grimaced. A blood-stained hockey mask stared back at him. This must be the guy who killed all those kids, he thought. Why did people keep going up to those goddamn campgrounds? Hadn't they learned by now? That place was a death trap. Five years ago, he remembered another series of murders at the old camp. He had heard the girl who survived went missing a few months later. Then again, he probably knew most of it was just an exaggerated legend spread by the locals, and Axel certainly made his contribution. After all, he got to see the injuries working in the morgue during these last murders. The guy really did a number on him. You had to be crazy to do something like that to a human being, he thought. Bodies literally found hanging from blood-stained bedsheets like sick pieces of artwork. A guy split in half down the middle like something out of a splatter film. Another girl with a spear lodged in her eye. And now, he had to be in the same room with the dead psychopath all night. Just great. Axel threw the sheet back over the body and pushed it into the cold room. Nurse Robbie Morgan hated going down to the basement. She didn't know why exactly. Maybe it was the fact that the basement was where the morgue was. And where there's a morgue, there are dead bodies, and despite her job, she hated the thought of death. She grimaced just at the thought of dying. She imagined the pain that those poor kids at Crystal Lake went through. How awful it must be to be murdered. The realization right before it happens. The adrenaline pumping through your veins. The sheer shock and agony as the knife plunges into your body as hands wrap around your throat, as you stare into the deranged eyes of your killer. Nothing you can say or do to stop it from happening. She shuddered. It had been a hell of a night at Wessex County Medical Center. The night shift was never this hectic. They were the only medical facility big enough to hold all of the bodies within 30 miles of Crystal Lake. They had still been recuperating from the night before when another group of kids, mostly college age, were murdered by apparently the same psycho. Nurse Morgan liked the job that she had, but sometimes it took an emotional toll on her. She had seen far too many sobbing parents tonight, too many mangled bodies being wheeled around on gurneys. It was all too much for her to take in at once. She could stomach the gore, but it was the reactions of the family members that really got to her. There was something about seeing the look of sheer despair on a parent's face at the prospect of never seeing their child again that chilled her to the bone. She just had to choose this as her profession, right? In this town, during a killing spree. Just my fucking luck, she thought. It made her almost not want to be a parent. She would constantly be worried about where their child was at every second of every day, just out of sheer fear of becoming a bereaved parent. Yeah, fucking parenting. She'd just keep using condoms and taking the pill. Besides, she was a young woman in med school. She didn't have time for kids. She didn't have much time to breathe, now that she was thinking about it. Could I really do this for the next three years, possibly more, she thought? Could she bear seeing the horrified faces of grieving mothers and fathers, and watch women faint in their family members' arms after learning their child was horribly murdered? But what can I do, she thought, throw in the towel, call it quits? She did have bills to pay. No, not now. She was already in her third semester working to be a registered nurse, and so much money and time was already invested. But if one more thing went wrong tonight, she might just finally do it. She was at her wit's end, back and forth from her station to patients' rooms, constantly hearing code blue or code red being called over the intercom system. Then she would have to run upstairs to hold down a patient in cardiac arrest, or run downstairs to meet with the doctor to take crying parents to identify their child's mangled bodies. She felt like she was going to break any second. At the end of the day, she had to remember why she had wanted to be a nurse in the first place. To help people. To be that friendly face that a grieving parent needs to see. To be the help in that kind of situation. But tonight was almost too much. She stopped to catch her breath and clear her thoughts in the stairwell. God, I need a smoke break, she thought. She probably looked like hell. No time to worry about that now. She had to go down to inventory. She collected herself for a moment and then climbed the rest of the stairs down to the morgue and walked down the narrow hallway. A single light flickered unsteadily up ahead. The rest of the hallway was shrouded in shadows. 
The walls creaked and the pipes in the wall groaned. She turned the corner, coming to a stop at the reception desk. Where the hell was everyone? They had bodies coming in, one after the other, and the morgue looked like a ghost town. She shrugged, glancing down at the clipboard. She jumped as two hands suddenly clamped down on her shoulders. She whirled around to face the morgue attendant, Axel, staring at her with lustful eyes. Oh, perfect, she thought. It's the other reason I hate going to the basement. I'm free, doll, Axel said. Yeah, at a bargain, and twice the price, Nurse Morgan snapped, turning her back to him. Hey, what's the matter? Axel questioned, placing his hand on the small of her back. Nurse Morgan let out a heavy sigh. I have a headache, Axel. For you, I always have a headache. I can fix that, Axel said, stroking her hair. Why don't you come in the cold room with me? I'm closing up for the night. What do you say? Axel, I'm not faking any more orgasms for you. Nurse Morgan quipped, pretending to write something down on her clipboard, hoping he would take the hint and leave her alone. You got the curse, Axel asked. If I do, you're it, Nurse Morgan said, forcing a smile. She pushed past him back down the hallway towards the staircase, forgetting what she came down there to do in the first place. Since the day she started working at Wessex County Medical Center, Axel had been giving her dirty looks and using every dim-witted, cliché pickup line in the book. What a pig, Nurse Morgan thought to herself. What happened to common courtesy? Chivalry really was dead. She had always thought that when you liked someone, you actually went up and talked to them like a civilized human being, not spew out sexual innuendos and blatantly look down their blouse. She couldn't believe how outright disgusting he was. How had someone not reported his sleazy ass? How has he not been fired already? She hated him, hated him with a passion. There was no way in hell she was going to meet him in the cold room. <laughs> Nurse Morgan stepped through the double doors into the cold room and stopped short. The room was pitch black dark. The light from a tiny television set illuminated a huge mass underneath a white sheet lying on a gurney. Was that him? The guy who killed all those kids? My God, she thought. Nurse Morgan craned her neck to see what was on the TV, and she smirked. Of course, she thought wryly. It was a woman's workout video, and the women might as well have been naked in their skimpy black leotards. Nurse Morgan shook her head and glanced around the room. Where the hell was he? Axel... Axel, she called. No answer. The only sound was the soft music coming from the workout video and the humming from the freezers in the back. Axel? She turned back to the television, grimacing in disgust at the workout tape. All three women were bent over in exaggerated sexual positions, moving from side to side, their assets in full view. Unbelievable, she thought to herself. How could anyone watch this shit? It was so demeaning to women. Who was she kidding? This was Axel she was talking about. She reached down to turn the channel when two hands wrapped around her waist and she let out a shrill cry. Axel stood there, a dumb grin on his face. So glad you could come, he said, trying to kiss her on the hand. Nurse Morgan angrily pulled her hand away. God, Axel, you are the Super Bowl of self-abuse, she exclaimed. I just want to watch the news. Nurse Morgan leaned down and turned the channel on the tiny television set, and a news broadcast flashed onto the screen. And now back to the tragic story of the mass slayings at Crystal Lake, the voice said. Nurse Morgan sat down on the edge of the folded gurney and stared intently at the screen. Axel plopped down next to her glumly. He looked over at her, his big brown eyes racked with guilt. He put on his best puppy dog eyes and scooted closer. Nurse Morgan glanced over at him and scoffed. And so begins another chapter of the story that most residents of Crystal Lake had prayed was over. A trail of mangled bodies has led authorities to conclude that... The announcer's voice was interrupted by a pulsing disco beat, and the ladies in the black leotards popped back onto the screen. Nurse Morgan looked at the remote in Axel's hand and frowned. As she opened her mouth to speak, she felt Axel's lips brush her neck. He nuzzled her hair, and his hand began to move up her back towards the zipper of her crisp white nurse's top. I came to watch the news, she said firmly, pushing him away. 
she leaned forward and switched the channel back to the news station. Authorities are still awaiting the identification of the perpetrator's body, which is currently being held at the Wessex County Medical Center morgue. Nurse Morgan glanced back nervously at the body on the gurney behind her. That's you they're talking about, Axel said, patting the huge mass behind him. Nurse Morgan's eyes widened, and she swatted at him. I don't believe you. Then shut my mouth, Axel said coyly, wrapping his arms around her and sliding her over to him. His lips pressed against hers, and his hand slipped inside of her uniform. Reluctantly, she kissed him back, running her hands through his hair. She finally succumbed, and she gently pushed him back onto the gurney. She straddled him, her hands sliding inside his lab coat, as his hands did the same with her nurse's top. She kissed him passionately. His hand found the zipper in the back, unzipped it, and he began fumbling with the clasp of her bra. In the midst of the hormone-induced rendezvous, they had no inkling of knowledge about the other presence in the room, a presence of stewing anger and deep hatred. They didn't see the large mass on the gurney behind them move ever so slightly, its chest rising and falling. Just as her bra was coming off in his hand, the white sheet behind them moved ever so slightly. A hand fell out from underneath the sheet. A scarred, deformed hand. The nails were blackened and filthy. It brushed Nurse Morgan's bare thigh. She shrieked and sprang to her feet, bringing Axel up with her. Jesus Christmas, holy Jesus, God damn it, holy Jesus, jumping Christmas shit. Axel cursed loudly, staring down at the unsightly hand dangling from underneath the white sheet. Nurse Morgan shrunk back into the corner, her chest heaving and her heart pounding. Her fear quickly turned into anger, and she pointed a finger at Axel. You'd better get that sucker in the icebox. I must be going nuts. I must... She stopped her furious diatribe when she noticed Axel's eyes directed at her unzipped blouse. She zipped it back up angrily, staring daggers at him. Good night, Axel, she said, making a beeline for the doors. Where are you going? Axel protested. I'm going crazy, she screamed back at him, and she disappeared down the hallway. <coughs> I'm an idiot, Nurse Morgan scolded herself. Why did she always have to give in to him? They had fooled around a few times before, and she immediately regretted it every time. Axel Burns was nothing but a quick fix, someone you did it with once and never thought about it or talked about it ever again. She was single, so it wasn't like she was doing anything she shouldn't be, but it still felt so wrong. She was leading the bastard on. There was no way in hell she was getting in a relationship with him. Maybe a quick make-out session to break the tension at work, but that was it. Axel was one of those guys that sits at every seedy dive bar and leers at you over a glass of beer, making kissy faces and being an overall creep. The guy that gets kicked out before the night is over because he won't stop harassing the women, or because he won't go home when the lights are being turned on and everyone is being sent out. This was the last time, she told herself, the absolute last time this was happening. She couldn't do it anymore. It wasn't fair to Axel, even if he was a complete idiot. She shoved open the door to hospital inventory and leaned against the shelf, regaining her composure. What was wrong with her? Was it the stress, the murders? That had to be it. That had to be it. With the sudden late-night rush of bodies, the stress was getting to her. She shouldn't have gone down there in the first place, but then again, she had hoped that she could just go in and have a place to relax and watch the news, without any of the people she worked with. And maybe, if Axel wasn't such a pervert, they could have just talked and had some coffee, and it could have made for a pleasant experience in the midst of the chaos. She surmised that's what she deserved for giving him that much credit. She looked at her watch. It was almost midnight. Her shift was almost over, and she hadn't done a bit of inventory like she was supposed to do every night. Damn you, Axel, she muttered under her breath. Guys are just pigs, she thought. She flipped through a few pages in her clipboard, scanning the inventory list, and then glancing up at the rows of shelves stocked with tiny glass vials in front of her. Jesus, Axel, she wondered. What made you like that? Just because your father was a slime ball doesn't mean you have to follow in his footsteps. Have some respect for yourself. Her thoughts began to trail off. She walked down the last aisle of shelves, standing on her toes to reach the top shelf. And just as her fingers grasped at the tiny jar above her head, the thought of Axel's sleazy hands crossed her mind again, and she didn't notice another vial sitting a little too close to the edge. 
Her clipboard bumped it as she stumbled forward, and it fell and shattered, spilling the biohazardous fluid on the floor. Shit! Shit! She swore through clenched teeth. What else could go wrong? It had to be the curse of Crystal Lake, she thought miserably. And the curse is Axel fucking Burns. Axel lifted up the sheet and stared in disgust at the masked man lying on the slab. Jesus, he thought. No wonder he wore that mask around. He dropped the sheet, rolled the masked man's corpse into the freezer, and slammed the door shut, not bothering to latch it. God, that bastard was heavy, Axel thought. Who'd have thought he'd be looking over a mass murderer? At least his job was a little bit more exciting now. He grabbed his cup of coffee off of the counter and sat back down on the folded gurney. His eyes glued to the TV screen, where the chicks and leotards were still bouncing and gyrating to the pulse of the synth beat. He grinned. Hi, girls. Thanks for waiting, he said, softly chewing his bottom lip. He gave the blonde in the middle a dirty look. She'd act right, thought Axel. She'd be willing to do anything to him. She wouldn't leave him horny and run off like a crazy person. Look at yourself, he chided himself, sitting here staring perversely at these total strangers. You didn't even know their names. What else could he do but stare at them? That's all there was to do in this dump. That's all he ever did anyways. Stare at chicks, stare at complete strangers, even the dead ones. He'd never had a steady relationship, never even been married. There was no way he was getting tied down to one broad. Women were far too complicated to be around for that long. He didn't know what the hell had just happened with Nurse Morgan. Usually she would have happily complied to fooling around before closing up. Not this time. What the hell was her problem? What had he done wrong? She was acting like she had never seen a dead guy before. That was the problem with broads, acting on their emotions and always blowing things out of proportion. You work as a nurse, in a hospital, he thought, and you get spooked by a body? Women, Axel scoffed under his breath. They needed to lighten up and learn to just have some fun. What else was there to do besides screw around at this job? He had so much downtime, that was the only thing to do besides sit in front of the TV, drink coffee, and get your rocks off. He took another sip of his coffee and cursed under his breath as a huge drop splattered onto his white lab coat. Damn it, he said, and reached to set his coffee on top of the TV. He didn't notice that the icebox behind him was empty, and the door was standing wide open. He didn't notice that a surgical hacksaw was missing from the table. As he sat back on the folded gurney, an immensely powerful hand clamped down his forehead, yanking him backwards. Axel had no time to scream or fight back. He didn't have time to process that he was actually being murdered. He saw the blade of the hacksaw move past him in a blur, and he felt a searing white-hot pain stronger than anything he had ever felt before. Warm blood began to flow down the front of his lab coat, and he realized that his throat had been slashed. The blade had sliced through his carotid artery, resulting in a brilliant geyser of blood that sprayed all over the television screen in front of him. Blood began to gurgle up in his throat, pouring from his mouth as he choked and gagged for air. White streaks of pain flashed in front of his eyes, and he felt his entire body going numb as he choked on his own blood bubbling up and cascading from his severed neck. Just as his life was being drained out of him, two hands grabbed him on either side of his head and twisted 180 degrees. He didn't feel a thing. There was the sickening sound of his neck snapping, and the last thing Axel saw before life became nothing but a blur was a man wearing a hockey mask standing over him, admiring his handiwork. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 1 of Friday the 13th, the final chapter 
a fan novelization by Landon Turner. Really enjoying the book so far. I like how Landon has taken more detail into the nurse and the morgue worker, uh, a little bit of stuff into Trish Jarvis, some of her backstory before moving, you know, Tommy and every, and everybody out to the Crystal Lake area. Uh, it's really cool to uh, kind of get more of an in-depth look at, you know, the people around where the murders happen, seeing the helicopters fly in, you know, really getting into the head of a couple of the characters dealing with the dead bodies and how that would weigh on them, you know, having to talk to the parents all night. So I'm really enjoying that aspect of it, and I'm looking forward to see what comes next. Let me know what you guys think of the book so far. Let, uh, you know, be sure to give Landon your thanks in the comments below, because without Landon, you wouldn't have a novelization for uh, Friday the 13th Part 4. So, uh, Landon, thanks for letting me narrate it. I am enjoying it, bud, and I'll be back very soon with more. Until then, this is your friendly neighborhood slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and we'll see you next time.